Ladies and gentlemen, we have a big show, a real big shoe. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and on today's show, we're talking retirement quizzes. Apparently, most Americans can't answer some basic questions about retirement. What should you know? Well, we'll run that by today's panel, including from Innovative Planning Partners, Daniel Angeloni. Plus, from Afford Anything, Paula Pant. And joining us from Marriage, Kids, and Money, it's Andy Hill. And in our Friday FinTech segment, we'll talk to the owner of the Penji app, Brittany Joyner. But wait, there's more. We're going to answer a magnify money question with help from our panel and still save time for some of my amazing trivia. And now, here to help you roll a bigger roll of Benjamins into the weekend, it's Joe Salcihai. We are going to roll some money into the weekend. Hopefully, that's the goal, isn't it? I am Joe Salci. I average Joe money on Twitter. And welcome to the weekend. And we're happy to help you get there with uh, one member of our regular panel, one scheduled guest, and some late night duct tape. (laughs) So let's explain what the heck we're talking about there. We're going to start with the woman who I believe is in Austin, Texas. It's our good friend, Paula Pant. Hello. Yes, I am in Austin, Texas, and I will be here until May. So I'm here for more than a month. Which is fantastic, Paula, because I got to tell you, Texas in the springtime, fantastic. That's what everyone has been saying to me from the moment that I arrived. Everyone said you came at the perfect weather time. So and it's great. The weather's been amazing. Well, how two days that I've been here so far. We're happy we could get you off of Sixth Street for about an hour to do this podcast. That's great. <laughs> And here, the guy who is uh, down the road from me, and he's our last minute duct tape as uh, Len had a work commitment. So happy you could join us from Marriage, Kids, and Money. It's our good friend, Andy Hill. Andy. How you doing, Joe? Well, we were going to have you just come down to the basement, and yet we found out your kids were going to watch Disney, and we got to ruin their night. Yeah, exactly. So we're going to take all the bandwidth for this call. The kids are crying upstairs. That's how we roll here in the Hill House. That's good. Marriage, kids, and money. It's all about what dad wants. (laughs) That's right. Exactly. (laughs) That's the whole thing. And we are super happy here to save the podcast from Innovative Planning Partners. It's our new friend, Dan Angeloni. How are you, Dan? I'm well. And and you guys are in, uh, in Rhode Island. Well, you guy, I'm, I'm alone you in guy. my office. No one, no one wanted to be here with me. Yes, they were in Rhode Island. <laughs> and uh, tell everybody about Innovative uh, Planning Partners, because I really like what you do. Oh, yeah. We're a team of my daughter, myself, and another gentleman, uh, Sean Holly. And we coach people. We don't just manage money. We coach people. Uh, we try to get people to enjoy what they do, enjoy what they've lived for, enjoy what they've saved for. Because one of the things that we find is that uh, – there's more to life than just saving. And it's all about, the, Dan, those conversations, isn't it? It's all about getting to know a client. It's all about asking. You know, one of the things that we do is we try to get a client, when they're getting into retirement, to duplicate what they enjoyed most about their working life. And believe it or not, that's a long conversation. But, yeah, it is all about the conversation. Do you ever feel like, though, Dan, getting out of the office and doing something different, maybe taking a vacation? Vacation. If you saw what I live, where I lived, you'd appreciate the fact that I don't go on vacation. Well, then uh, well then everybody could come visit you in beautiful Rhode Island then. You got it. No, actually, uh, that's more than welcome. We enjoy company. I can't stand to be alone with my wife. <laughs> <laughs> and I bet she can't stand to be alone with you, I would guess. Well, that's why she's not here. That's right. <laughs> Well, if either one of you wants to get away, this episode of Stacky Benjamin is brought to you by Away. Away makes first-class luggage, Dan, at coach prices that allows you to charge your phone on the go. For $20 off a suitcase, head to awaytravel.com forward slash SB20. For 20 bucks off, that's awaytravel.com forward slash SB20. Then use promo code SB20. So uh, when she has you pack your bags, Dan, for saying that on the show, you now have 20 bucks off your suitcase. Yeah, I have my own set of uh, plastic bags, too. There it is. <laughs> we, got, we got a great show today. We got Dan Angeloni with us. We got Andy Hill. We got Paula. What could be better? Let's get this party started. 
Hello, darlings. And now, it's time for your favorite part of the show, our Stacking Benjamin's Headlines. Our headline today comes to us from Market Watch, and this is written by Alessandra Melito. You know, Alessandra, is, we've talked about her pieces so many times, we should really have her on the show. Andy, you're she's nodding. You, you, I, I like her a lot. Absolutely. Yeah. She's, she covers some great material and uh, really supports a lot of people in our community, too. Yeah, it does a great job. Uh, this piece that Alessandra wrote says, most people of all ages failed this retirement quiz. Here are the answers. So we're going to cheat. We're going to go right for the answers. How about that? (laughs) Uh, She writes, Americans didn't ace this retirement pop quiz. Only about one in five Americans know how much they're allowed to contribute to a 401k plan. And a little more than a quarter know non-working spouses can contribute to an individual retirement account, according to a TD Ameritrade survey of more than a thousand adults, 22 years or older, with at least $10,000 in investable assets. She writes, that's a problem considering so few people are saving enough for their futures or even understand how much they need to save to get there. About 18% of Americans say they're, quote, very confident they'll have a financially comfortable retirement. 49% say they were somewhat confident, according to Employee Benefit Research Institute data. Not only do people underestimate how much they'll need for the future, but they may not know how to start investing or what the rules are, as the TD survey results suggest. Let's start, Dan, with you as the planner here. Alessandra writes, not only do people underestimate how much they'll need for the future. Do you find that to be true? The number needs to be bigger than most people think. Yeah. in in a sense, it is more than most people think, but what we find is that people are kind of oblivious. When we start working with people, they're really oblivious to what it means. I've actually had people come in here and when you sit down and start to explore that, I actually get answers like, well, I don't plan on living that long, (laughs) which is a little disheartening, but it's not only a function of them not understanding what it means. It's also a function of them not realizing what it takes to get there. A goal is not something to achieve. It's a direction. It's a road sign. It's funny when we look at these different things, uh, Paula, what is the 401k contribution limit? Is that important to know? Well, I don't know if it is because the article later goes on to say that a very small percentage of people actually reach the contribution limit. So the contribution limit is important to know if you are using that as a benchmark to set a goal for yourself. But given how few people actually hit that limit in the first place, uh, that might just be irrelevant data. That's that's what I was thinking, Andy. That's what Google's for, or my friend Bing. <laughs> yeah, sometimes these quizzes are, I don't know, they're a little, little clickbaity where it's like, oh, a lot of people don't know what the limit is. It's like, but do they really need to know the limit? How about just contributing and taking advantage of your employer match, right? I think that's the important thing, Dan, just start putting some money away. Yeah, and I've never heard that question asked. I've never had that question. What's the limit? Yeah, like most people I work with don't have enough to get near the limit. Right. Well, and seriously, when somebody asks you that type of question, don't you immediately go to some resource like a Google or a Bing to find out the exact right number? What's well, Bing? Well, yeah. <laughs> well, here's the, the thing. Away trade secrets here. <laughs> it's it's that thing that you go to when you're not uh, going to ask Jeeves. Oh, right, 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 right. Uh, web crawler, right? I got to tell yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Kind of like dog pile. Yeah. Can, we link, can we link up on MySpace? That's right. Love it. Wait, you guys can joke all you want about Bing, but let me tell you what I like about Bing. Bing and Google, for me, give me the exact same results, but Bing will actually pay you to use it. And I don't know if, if anybody knows that. Wow. I did not Fill know me that. In. Yeah, if, if, if you sign in at Bing, don't get me wrong, it doesn't give you a lot of money, but I got to look stuff up every day for the podcast, and I end up getting probably in a year, I'm going to say $40 of Amazon money just by searching no with Bing instead of Google. Yeah, so initially, oh initially I was with you. I'm like, what the hell is this Bing? And now I don't even think about Google. I go right to Bing. So there's there's 40 bucks plus $20 we gave you for the luggage. I mean, we're, <laughs> we're giving you money. We're just wow. throwing money. Hey, hey Joe, Joe, will you email that information to me at my earthlink.net account? <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's enough of that. But let's let's get on to this thing. What does it mean to max out a 401k? Paula, you surprised people get that one wrong? I am not surprised that people get that one wrong because I hear people in my audience get that wrong all the time. People will say, oh, I maxed out my 401k. I put $4,000 in it. And what they mean is that they reached their full employer match. But unfortunately, a lot of people don't understand that to max out a 401k is to hit the contribution limit. They believe that what it means is to hit the employer match. And so oftentimes, whenever I hear somebody say that they maxed it out, 
I ask them the clarifying question of what exactly do you mean by that? Yeah. Andy, if they're putting away Paula's example of 4%, sadly, that for most of us, that's not going to cut it for retirement. No, unfortunately not. I mean, it only can get you so far, especially with all of the things that we need to pay for in life, whether it's kids college or helping our parents out down the road or God willing us retire. I mean, yeah, we got, we got to be putting away a lot more than 4%. How do you, Dan, when you guys are working with somebody on a plan and how much to put into the retirement plan, let's say it's a 401k at work. How do you go about determining what that number is? Wait a minute. I'm switching to Bing. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Actually, um, what we do is we determine the lifestyle they want to lead uh, because believe it or not, it has to start there. And then we determine, we kind of back into it. What do you want to do when you retire? What do you want to do when you get to a certain age? Oh, I want to buy an airplane. Well, that's not happening. So what else do you want to do? But what we do is we essentially back into it. Uh, yeah. Start with the end of mine. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Next is how much are you paying in fees for your employer sponsored account? Andy, I'm not surprised on this one. Nobody has a clue what they pay in fees in their 401k. It could be because of those 84 page documents that we're supposed to read with magnifying glasses. (laughs) Potentially. (laughs) But it's funny. People complain, though, Andy, seriously, about not knowing their IRA fees. And yet in a 401k, I think personally, it's way harder to figure out what the fees are to 401k than it is in an IRA. Absolutely. Well, I mean, a big part of the great people that you're bringing on the show and a lot of conversations that you're having in the fintech world is people are breaking down that barrier and trying to make this easier. Companies like Bloom, I love what they're doing to make that process easier and getting things going. So absolutely. Technology for the win. Paula, does that surprise you? People have no idea about their fees? That doesn't surprise me at all. And in in fact, you know how credit cards are required to send you a disclosure form in which everything is very, very neatly laid out in these boxes so it's, it reads almost like this matrix where you've got a box that has a clear question and then the corresponding box with the answer. I think if investment accounts, if, if brokerage accounts were required to do something like that, people would have a much better understanding of it. Is there a place like that, Dan, that, that you know of where people can go to look at what their 401k fees are that'll make it easier? Well, you can go to the website where your 401k is stationed, or you could go to Bing. But at any rate, (laughs) what I find interesting, though, is that one of the reasons I believe that people don't really pay much attention to that is because the requirement to disclose that information is relatively new. What's it been, like three years? Obviously, that's not top of mind for people. As time goes on, it'll become more and more top of mind. Yeah, I'd love to see, what Paula, what you're talking about, like a mortgage or whatever, where it just very simply says, over the lifetime of your account, here's what you're going to pay in fees. Yeah, that that? would be great. Next is back of the food box. Right. Yeah, your nutrition. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Can you contribute to a 401k and a traditional IRA at the same time? Slightly more than half of survey participants got this question right. Well, about a fifth said they didn't know, and 11% said no. Dan, you find that surprising? Not at all. As a matter of fact, I remember hearing not too long ago, maybe, I don't know, not too long ago. It depends on. uh, I view that I'm a really old person Um, about 15 years ago that there are 10 to 12 changes to IRA rules every month. So it's not surprising to me at all. Yeah. People don't pay close attention to that stuff. And by that, you mean those little rules around the edges where you're seeing like the IRS tweaking things? Yeah, exactly. I mean, they're constantly messing with it. It doesn't affect everybody. Sure. But there's so many changes that people can't keep up with this stuff. The contribution limit for IRAs and when's the deadline? Paula, it seems to me the deadline's way more important than the contribution limit. Well, again, most people aren't reaching the contribution limit. So um, knowing that information is helpful if you're using it to set a goal or if you think that you might actually hit the limit. But given the fact that the majority of people don't, then sure, the deadline is what matters. I want to skip here to the last one, Andy. What are the required minimum distributions? It seems like as much as we don't know about putting money in, nobody has a clue about taking money out. Yeah. And obviously this is something that's very little in my mind too, as far as things that I'm considering right now as a late thirties guy to trying to save for his retirement. All I want to do is probably put as much as possible now in. And uh, yeah, if they're going to require me to take it out at 70 at a certain point, then that's fine. I, that's why I'm getting into the Roth too, which doesn't actually have to, you know, deal with that. Do you disclose your age, Andy? Do you tell people how old you are? Oh, well, I, every time I want to talk to anybody. Yes, of course. Yes. Th- 37, everybody. Everybody. Hey. <laughs> it's like, you know how old I am? <laughs> the, uh, well, the reason I asked that is, Dan, I wanted to ask you for a guy who's 37 years old then, 
does it matter that he knows about minimum distributions now or have his strategy of how he's going to take money out? I mean, will that inform how he's going to put money in? I'm not sure it's important to know about RMDs because once you get to that point, it becomes uh, it becomes only important when you have to start doing them. What's more important to somebody at 37 years old is, in my estimation, is, again, to know what they need to be saving based on their cash flow. Yeah. And that's obviously infinitely more important. Listen, this compounding is a fabulous tool. And sometimes if you just close your eyes and do what you got to do, things just happen. And when you're 37 years old, God, he's got plenty of time. But it doesn't mean you don't start now, but plenty of time. That's why, worry about RMDs. that's why Dan Andy's going to start next week, week after next. <laughs> hey, listen, I can work Tomorrow. with it. <laughs> you know what else I find interesting about RMDs, though? Some of my more wealthy clients get really irritated that they have to do an RMD. It just bothers the hell out of them. Some of my younger clients, or some not younger clients, excuse me, but some of my lesser wealthy clients, they look forward to it. It's like a dog with a bone. Uh, and they usually don't wait till they're 70 and a half. Uh, they start drawing at 59 and a half or uh, 60 because they need the money or want the money. They want to buy a car, fill in the blank. But that's an interesting side discussion. I mean, for your wealthier clients, isn't that good? I mean, it forces them then to either start spending a little money on themselves, doing some things, or at least think about that money in a different way than just letting it sit there forever for something that's, I mean, for nothing. Yeah, well, actually, that's a good segue because one of the things that we try to coach our clients into doing is actually rewarding themselves. Because if you're saving and you don't reward yourself for doing that, then you start to resent saving. Then it becomes a futile attempt. You know, what are you doing? Did you ever see those bumper stickers? I'm I'm, I'm spending my kids' inheritance. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> well, I got a stack of them. I give them to a lot of people. That's awesome. You know, Paula, every time she, she saves a dollar, she takes out a dollar fifty to celebrate. So Exactly. Yeah. I thought you were gonna say every time I save a dollar, an angel gets its wings. <laughs> <laughs> She's had two angels get wings so far, which is fantastic. <laughs> yeah, that's let's turn this on this head because because frankly, even though I love Alessandra and I think that these are some decent points. I don't think these are the most important things to think about retirement or to, to, to worry about about retirement. Let's talk about with each of you, what's the single biggest thing you think people should worry about when it comes to their retirement? Paula, we'll start with you. Hmm. Well, for people who aren't saving enough, I'd say the single biggest thing to think about is a, a lot of people, as we said earlier, think, well, I don't plan on living that long or I don't plan on ever retiring because I like my job. So I'm just going to work until I'm 80. Right. So for people who aren't saving, I think the thing to think about is to reframe retirement, not as the time at which you stop working, but rather as a uh, self-funded form of insurance or a self-funded form of protection for the possibility that once you are in your 60s or older, you might not be healthy enough to work. Yeah. So it's a self-insurance policy. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And I think reframing it that way could encourage people to save more because essentially because then it, it plays on your fears rather than your hopes. That sounds terrible, but I mean. No, well, it's funny because uh, your good friend, uh, Susie Orman, puts it very similarly, Paula. She ac <laughs> she actually says that, um, you know, if you don't feel like saving for retirement now in your, let's say, your Andy's age, uh, how are you going to feel when you're 55? Like put yourself in as a 55 year old and all of a sudden or 65 and all of a sudden you feel a lot differently. Like if you, if you don't think you can do it now, put yourself at that age and you'll start feeling this fear. Hmm. Uh, what can I say? I guess she and I share many thoughts in common. You, you guys have so much in common. Uh, <laughs> Andy, how about you? Biggest thing to worry about, about retirement. Well, you know, I, I was thinking a, a big takeaway, especially since what um, Dan brought up is just if people want to get excited about it or or get on board, just take a look into compounding because it is exciting when you start to look at what your money can do over time and you really don't have to do a lot to make it happen. Uh, that's a way to get excited about it. Yeah. Yeah. So exciting to use the rule 72 to find out. And we could get a uh, being that everybody <laughs> the rule, <laughs> rule of 72. Uh, Dan, you're our special guest. You get the last word. What's the biggest thing people need to think about when it comes to retirement? Well, first of all, both Paul and Andy's comments are brilliant, and I mean that sincerely. But I will tell you this. You start talking about compounding in Rule 72, you want to watch people's eyes gloss over? That'll do it. 
the thing that they need to be aware of and the thing that we try to coach them on is to be aware that they will someday have leisure time. And it's something that needs to be funded. And we try again to ask them to like explore with us what their life is going to look like because that's going to gauge what they need to do. But it's funny because people don't necessarily equate saving with living a retirement lifetime, a lifestyle. For some reason, a lot of people think they can rely on Social Security. We know how that goes. But again, it's just a function of trying to quantify their lifestyle during retirement so that they'll understand what they need to do. Not an easy thing to do, by the way. Upstairs Talking to Mom right now is the most unique founder we've ever talked to. Not unique in the way that she's a unique person. And Brittany Joyner certainly is somebody who's unique. But even cooler than that, the app is still very much in the development stage. You can't get it yet. You can get on the wait list. You can hear all about it. You can follow Brittany as she creates this app. But we've talked before to companies that help people create apps. We've talked to founders. What about somebody who's right in the middle of the process? Like if you're so passionate about this, how do you create a new app? Well, that's why I'm excited to talk to Brittany Joyner today. Coming down to the basement, telling us about her road and struggles making this thing a reality. Let's say hi to Brittany Joyner. And coming down the stairs to the basement, my new friend, Brittany Joyner, joins us. How are you? I am doing great. It's so much warmer down here than I thought it was going to be. I thought I'd need to bring like some hot hands or a space heater or something, but it's it has got it nice and comfortable down here. That's all for Doug because Doug's a diva. And so because of that, we have to make sure that it's warm enough for him. Otherwise, we don't get the uh, unintentional comedy that we end up getting from him. Got to make sure there's room for that. Yeah, right. Tell me how to pronounce the name of the app. Yeah, so I call it Penge, and I'll tell you where the name comes from because I think it's actually a really interesting story, but it's the Danish word for money, and the reason I chose that is because as I was trying to figure out what do I call this, I need to get a website, I was really trying to figure out a name. Someone was like, just look at like the word money in different languages, and I was like, that might be kind of weird, but then I looked it up, and I found the Danish word for money is Penge, and I really liked the Danish language for a couple reasons. One, because a lot of their words are focused on community and comfort, and as you're about to learn, that's what I really want my app to focus around as well, and also uh, Denmark has, I believe, one of the like highest financial literacy rates in, maybe it's Europe or maybe it's the world, but they're pretty good with their money over there, and it also sounds like productive spend, Penge, productive spend. So I was like, oh, sure, let's let's go with this. So I started the name and I was like, I'm not really married to it, but I'm slowly getting married to it. <laughs> I wish you'd thought about that a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> like, I seriously wish you had you had considered that at all. <laughs> like, I'm I'm completely yeah, joking. You know, yeah. just put a little bit of thought into it. Yeah. Yeah. You hadn't thought about the about the name at all. So is your background in computers? Is it in finance? Where? What's your background in? My background is actually mostly in marketing. So I work full time as a marketer. I graduated from college about four years ago, and that's what I've been doing ever since. I'm a huge personal finance nerd. I grew up the whole Dave Ramsey way, you know, learning you you spend less than you make. You always save X percent. You give X percent sort of thing. I remember reading about compounding interest when I was like 12 years old before I even had a job or a paycheck. And I was like, ah, this is amazing. I can't wait to start working. And like my money's going to make money for me. So that's my personal finance background. And as I've gotten older, I've realized that just because I knew all the right terms, it didn't really mean I actually knew what to do with my money. And so, for example, I earlier uh, this year, I was trying to set up a IRA on E-Trade. I had set it up a few years ago, but didn't touch anything in it. And I just assumed, oh, I have money automatically going in there. It's going to, you know, do do whatever the IRA thing does. I realized this year when I was looking at it, I never told it what to do with that money. So it was just sitting there in like effectively a 0% interest savings account. And thankfully, it wasn't like a large sum of money, but it was a real awakening moment for me that like, you know, I feel like I have a finance background. Like I've learned a lot of this stuff. I was an accounting minor in college. Why am I struggling? Like if I'm struggling with this, how does everybody else figure this stuff out? So I have a background, but I'm still learning is, is the way I like to say how I fit in the personal finance space. But where did the idea for an app come from? 
So it was definitely an iteration. It was about this time last year, I was really sort of struggling with, you know, I know I need to pay off debt. I know I need to be investing. I know I need to be moving money into savings. How do I prioritize that? I don't even know how to like set up my IRA. Like I don't understand this sort of stuff. And I was like, I'm going to learn everything I can. So I think that's when I started listening to uh, the Second Benjamins podcast. I started following all sorts of blogs, reading all the books. That's the way I absorb knowledge is like I go all in, read a million miles an hour, read everything I can find. And I realized that wasn't actually helping either. Like I, there's almost like too much information out there that like I needed like actual people to sort of talk to like podcasts were really the closest I could get to good content because you actually hear a conversation. But what it came down to was I realized I just need to talk to somebody about it. And I was like, it's weird to talk about money. We don't talk about money. I kind of got over myself and talked to some friends that I trusted and knew like they know what they're doing with their money. And I was like, hey, this is going to be stupid, but I know all these terms. I know this is roughly what I'm supposed to be doing, but I don't know what that comes to. Like, what buttons do I press in E-Trade, you know, like type of thing. And so they talked me through it and like spending 30 minutes talking with them was a thousand times better than all of the research I had done. And so that kind of triggered the idea to me that like, there's got to be a better way to do this. There's plenty of apps out there. There's plenty of books, plenty of content, yet we're still struggling. Some of us are at least still struggling to make the right sort of financial decisions. And so it made me think about, there's definitely something there with talking to people, but what else is that? And then kind of throughout the rest of the year, there still wasn't a full idea there. It just took a while to kind of form. And then I read um, Dollars and Cents by Dan Ariely. Have you ever read that book? Uh, Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Oh, I love it. Yeah. Yes. Yes. It's a great book. So I can take you to the time that I, the the part of the road I was driving on when I was actually listening to the audiobook version of that on a trip I was taking to Tennessee. He talks about a lot of different things that just really sparked my interest. But one of them was he was like, a lot of that good financial behavior is invisible. What if we were to make that more visible? And so that really brought up the, oh, we're always posting on Instagram about when we get a new car, when we take a new trip. And I see that I'm like, yeah, I want to do that. But what if we were talking about buying stocks or making extra payments on debt? What if we were talking about that sort of stuff? Would that make us more likely to do that? And so honestly, around that time is when Penge was really born as a way to bring into accountability and community and tracking around building the right sort of financial habits. So it's not an app that's going to, uh, you know, help you cut back on how much you spend on coffee. I'm not interested in helping people go from spending $30 a month on coffee to $5 a month. Uh, It's not going to automate your finances. It's not a robo advisor. It's not going to show you super complicated pictures of your net worth. It's for the people who are not met by those types of apps, the people who are like sort of know what I need to do, but I need that extra sort of push. And so Penge lets you track how often you make good financial decisions and not just the dollar amounts, but the actions themselves. So it's not about just looking at the big milestones, but rather building the right habits to get there and surrounding you with accountability and community around that. So now you've got this idea. You've got this fantastic idea. How do you jump on the app train then? I mean, if if you're somebody who's in marketing and personal finance, I think then the bridge you got to cross is this technology bridge. Like, how do you go, okay, now I get to dive into coding. First of all, my thought was, nope, we're not building an app. App space is way too competitive. There's way too many out there. Nope, it's it's horrible. We're not doing that. And I kept trying to think through other ways to make it work. And some people would be like, oh, just like make more content. And I'm like, "Ah, I don't think content's the issue. And so really where it came, that sort of bridge, and I'm still not the coder. And I'm actually, that's the point I'm at right now with trying to figure this part out is like, I've got a few options of people who are willing to build it. And so trying to figure out what, let's get this party started. What does that exactly look like? Because- I've been looking for a good reason to become a programmer. I very much love that logical sort of thinking. I would love to be a programmer, but if we're waiting on me to build this app, it's probably going to be a couple of years. And I, I don't think we can wait that long. So for me, it's, I'm, I'm trying to learn code enough to kind of understand the general direction we need to go, but I'm planning to to leave that to the experts who really know how to do that and also be able to work with them to have, you know, the familiarity of here's what's working, here's the, here's the sort of vision here and understand what's going on, but also specialization of labor. I'll let the people who are good at that take care of that and I'll help direct the other sort of pieces. How did you find those people? Uh, a lot of reaching out to people, honestly. One of the things that helped the most was I was connected to an incubator here in Lexington, Kentucky that teaches people how to code. And so they've got some people lined up who, you know, are willing to take on different projects and sort of things like that. And so uh, I'm in the process of still trying to get some more quotes and kind of decide, do I want... 
do I want like a technical co-founder who's in it with me for the equity type of thing? Do I want to pay for some of these programs where the students actually have graduated from the boot camp and now they're looking for their first full-time project sort of thing? What do I want that to look like there? I'm also reaching out to the college here, University of Kentucky, and trying to connect with some students there who might be looking for a project as well. So that's definitely been a challenge. I'll admit that's not the easiest part. I think a lot of times we we think, oh, we have an idea. Everybody knows how to code and it's easy to learn how to code. So let's just do it. And it's not really that simple. You've got to reach out. You've got to connect with a lot of people. You've got to ask if somebody knows somebody knows somebody and and really try to try to connect and find somebody. And it's not even just finding the first person you find, right? It's a partnership. You've got to be committed and know that they're in it and they're interested in it too and that you're going to work well together. But you've already got I mean, just looking at the at the Penge app website, by the way, everybody, it's P-E-N-G-E A-P-P dot com. I mean, you've already got some great screen grabs. It looks like yeah. it, it looks like there's a huge piece of it that's already done. Who worked on that part? A friend of mine, he's an incredible designer, and I came to him basically with the idea of my really sorry mock-ups of here's what I kind of want it to look like. And he was like, oh, let me help you. And so now what you see now is his beautiful, beautiful work from, you know, maybe we'll sneak peek and show you my original screenshots here. And it's terrifying. But the purpose behind having this site is I wanted to validate the idea. I didn't want to just say, okay, I've got this great idea because I think it's great. Everyone else in the world is going to think it's great. And so I was like, let's market it. Let's put it out there and get feedback on it and iterate and see, is this something people want? And then we'll decide to go build it. So that's one of the reasons I'm super interested to hear from your audience is I'm still in the process of validating this idea. But let me back up there because for you, as somebody who is an inventor and an entrepreneur creating this, you said something that everybody in that area knows but it's it's something that I don't think a lot of our listenership knows, which is you said that you are validating the idea and then you go build it, which, right. which by the way, friends, and I'm just going to jump on Brittany. I'm going to steal your show for just a second. I'm going to go for it. I'm going to jump on my step stool. I have seen so many bad ideas built to completion that nobody wants. And so yep. this idea of making sure that there's an audience for your idea first I think is a phenomenal idea and something that would have saved so many people so much money. I see people that should have never gone into the restaurant business, go into restaurants, people open up clothing stores that have no business opening up clothing stores. So the idea of testing and validation, just uh, don't want to, don't want to let that go before we keep moving on. Oh, right. But anyway. Yeah, no, that's huge. That's huge. And that's been a big part of, so I really started working on this uh, late September of last year. And so less than six months, I've really been focused on this. And in that time, what I've done is I've had like personal interviews with over 50 people and I'm still trying to continue to do those, basically doing similar sort of things to what we're doing now, where I'm talking to somebody, putting the idea out there and getting their feedback on, oh, I like this. I don't like this. I would use this aspect. I would not use this aspect. This helps with this problem. This, this doesn't really really help with the problem. So I've done a lot of surveys to better try to understand people's financial behavior. So I'm um, trying to understand, do you share on social media things about money? A lot of people don't. Yet three questions later, they will say that they're more likely to reach a goal when they talk about it with other people. And it's like, no wonder we're not reaching our financial goals. Like we, we say we don't talk about money, but then at the same time, we admit we are more likely to reach our goals when we talk about it. And so um, doing that sort of thing, I've even had a few different betas to try to prove out the concept. Very difficult to do when you're not a programmer and uh, what you want to build is an app. So I basically strung together some complicated things with Google Forms and Google Sheets and uh, had my designer friend help me build up like some mock-ups that I was able to manually plug numbers and graphics sort of into to help sort of recreate the experience. And so, yeah, I totally agree. Like validation is the most important part. And what's the point of building something that people don't really want? I'm not interested in just building this for the fun of it. I want to know it's solving a problem. How's the idea different now than in the beginning based on all the feedback you've had so far? What's what's gone away and what's new that's in it now? The biggest thing that's gone away is a lot of little things that didn't matter. So I think at first, if we would had this conversation about six months ago, we would have had about 30 minutes of word vomit of like, ooh, let's have leaderboards. Ooh, let's have reward systems going on. Ooh, let's have accountability partners. There would just be, I can't even keep track of all the different things that we've eventually just been like, okay, that's maybe down the road. And that's what I have to keep telling myself because sometimes you get so wrapped up in your idea. It's your, it's your baby. And you're just like, I want to hold on to all of these things. You have to be like, no, 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 not now. We're getting enough feedback that this isn't useful right now, maybe down the road. And so that's probably where it's changed the most thinking through the aspect of uh, not just 
it's a finance app, but it's something that helps you track things while incorporating accountability and community around it. Also, the part that's iterated a little bit too is how much we share. So what the app initially was going to kind of be was more focused around you go in and you say, here's how much I make, here's how much debt I'm in, different sort of things. And it compares you with other people like you. Well, I found out another company is actually already doing that. It's called Status Money. I'm not sure if you've heard of them, yeah. but it's, it's a really great tool. Yeah, yeah we've had uh, them on. Oh, awesome. Cool. Okay. Maj is awesome. I've, I've chatted with him some, but, uh, it's, it's definitely a really cool tool, but I realized that's already there. I don't need to solve that problem. And so then continuing to talk to people, I was able to find the people who are like, yeah, but I want something more like ongoing, like something like that is definitely fantastic to get like a baseline, but how do I keep talking, having this sort of conversation ongoing with others around me and people kind of spurring me on and encouraging me. So not just in a like competitive aspect of like, oh, I'm saving more money than you, but more of like, hey, you're almost there to your goal. Keep crushing it. We're in this together kind of thing. And so learning what people are comfortable with sharing and what people aren't. Dollar amounts is one of those things we're still not there yet. People don't want to see a newsfeed that says, Brittany moved $100 from checking into savings. That's too much for them to see and to push out, but they're happy to see Brittany move some money from checking to savings, or Brittany made an extra payment on her student loans, or Brittany is 70% through paying with her student loans. So people are comfortable with showing the actions or percentages and progress, but they don't want to show the actual dollar amount. So that's probably what is iterated the most is like finding the right balance of what to share and what not to share. That's funny. Making inroads in an area where people don't talk at all to at least talking about some of the things. Right. Progress. It's, Absolutely. It's, you know, baby steps. I see on your site, you were in at least one pitch contest. How did that go? It was a fantastic experience and made some really great connections from it. Did not win though. And I think part of that is because I just don't actually have that product yet. And so all the other companies that were competing, you know, they're already like, it might've been a little early for me to compete because they had, you know, actual products. They've are, they're already like making revenue and sales and things like that. So it was a little bit tricky. I kind of knew going into it, I probably wasn't going to win it, but I made tons of great connections. I uh, had a lot of feedback that the presentation was amazing. People loved it. I got people to laugh. I don't think anybody cried. So I guess that's kind of probably good. <laughs> um, I was told that I handled the questions from the judges really well. Had a lot of people come up and actually people join my waiting list after, which by the way, is kind of my biggest KPI for right now in terms of validating the idea. I'm working on, like I said, finishing up who's going to build it. What does that look like? But my biggest KPI at this point is how many people can I get on a waiting list that says, yes, I want to use this when it's ready. Send it to me kind of thing. And we're going to work on that with you here next in just a second. But let's go back to where we started. You are located in Kentucky. Most of the founders we talk about or talk to rather are in Silicon Valley. A few are in New York, but mostly they're they're out west. How do you find your community? Yeah, so it's definitely tricky. I just kind of encourage myself by the fact that I have such a lower cost of living. Like, right. you know, who, who needs friends when you got, no, I'm just kidding. Um, but it's actually been a little bit of a challenge, but there's a great incubator group that I was mentioning here in Lexington, Kentucky, that really is focused on bringing that entrepreneurship sort of community together. And I've had the opportunity of, you know, somebody told me about them and I got connected with them. And through that, I'm starting to find these other little pockets of communities and groups here. So different sort of people within that that group who are affiliated with small business development or different sort of things around here. And it's not like you would see in Silicon Valley, but I've got a network of people who, when I've got these questions I want to ask, like they're there ready to answer them and talk through them. And there's events like this pitch contest that go on and different sort of things like that. And so I feel like it's kind of a thing you make the best with what you've got. And the company I work for full-time they actually are based out in the Bay Area. And so I get to go out there kind of every now and then and uh, make connections with different sort of people out there. So I also find the internet makes the world a lot smaller. So no, I'm not in Silicon Valley, but it's uh, pretty easy for me to follow people who are out there or even connect with them. I actually emailed uh, the CEO and founder of uh, YC or Y Combinator. Like that was really cool to see that he like actually responded back to my email sort of thing. And so I think no matter where you're at, you definitely have a chance. It's how much you put yourself out there and are willing to reach out. Well, to your point too, with technology, I mean, talking to people at Y Combinator or wherever, they're just a keyboard away. So you're, you're exactly. Yeah. So you're right there. So let's do this. If uh, people want to join the waiting list uh, or for the Penji app, how do they do it? 
Yeah. So just go to penjap.com, P-E-N-G-E-A-P-P.com. And you can see on the site there, I explain the concept a little bit more than what we've kind of gone through in here. You can see some screenshots that my wonderful designer friend, not myself, designed, and you can kind of get a vision for what the app looks like and how it would work. And so, uh, yeah, I encourage you to look around on there, sign up for the waiting list. I do not bombard you with emails. My goal is to send like one to two a month. And it's pure like update emails of the last one I sent out said, Hey, we were in a pitch contest last month. Here's two new posts I wrote on the blog, different sort of things like that. So you won't get bombarded with emails or anything like that. And it's genuinely, uh, I ask that if, if you are interested in it, I would love for you to join so I can keep you in the loop and, and help more people to uh, get more comfortable talking about money and reach their financial goals. I love following uh, apps, and it's funny that I still pronounce the name wrong. The, the, <laughs> it's it's a tricky, it's a challenge. It's definitely a challenge that I know I'm going to have, and like one of the reasons that every now and then I'm like, maybe we need to change it to something. <laughs> yeah, I don't know though, because once uh, once you get behind uh, why it's named that, it, it definitely is a differentiator. So so I don't know, but what I do like, I love the fact that most weeks we have completed apps here that people can get right now. I love the fact that we're going to get to follow your story over the next several months and, um, yeah. and, and see how the pen chip, see where it goes next. So yes. Brittany Joyner, thanks for joining us for a few minutes and chatting about the pen jab. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Hey there, trivia fans. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. And today's a big day on our calendar here in the basement. It's Gregory Peck's birthday. And while Mr. Peck died in 2003, he'll always live on as a great American actor who played many iconic roles, but none more so than that of Atticus Finch, the lawyer in the epic film version of the book To Kill a Mockingbird. Writer Harper Lee lived for years on the proceeds of the novel, which makes us wonder about today's trivia question. How much money did Harper Lee bring in per year, on average, according to Bloomberg from the book To Kill a Mockingbird? We'll be back with the answer in just a moment. All right. Thanks for that question, Doug. And we explain these complicated rules to Dan backstage. <laughs> Dan, you think you Actually, got your, yeah. Yeah, you think you got your arms around it, right? I'm for, holding tight. For those of you playing the entire year-long game for some amazing prize, which we haven't disclosed. In first place is OG with five. Paula broke the Len Paula tie last week. Woohoo! Pull ahead at three into second, and Len has two. Dan will be playing for Len, and Andy's going to play for OG, which means, Dan, you get to decide. So how much money per year on average did Harper Lee make off of To Kill a Mockingbird? Would you like to guess first in the middle or last? You know something? Uh, I'm going to guess first. You are going to, wow, okay. Yeah, that, that is yeah, awesome. Okay, hold I'm on. I'm living the dream. All right. I drink milk when it expires. <laughs> before you guess, before you guess, let's then go to, uh, Let's. who does that mean? It means we go to Paula. Paula, you want to go in the middle or last? I will go last. You're going to go last. So, Andy, that puts you in the middle. So, Dan, you're going to guess first, how much money on average does Harper Lee make off of To Kill a Mockingbird? Well, I have to be careful here because I'm playing for someone else, right? That's right. All right. So I'm going to say. But but just to be not to cut you off there after no, you no, just ahead. started, you're playing for Len and Len just kind of throws a dart. So don't worry about being oh. careful. Do you guys like Len? <laughs> we we <do. laughs> Most of the time. Yes. Most of the most time we do. Yeah. yeah. Do you like him now? <laughs> yes, yeah. absolutely. Okay. Two hundred and twenty one thousand three hundred and seventeen dollars and eighty four cents. Two twenty one mm. seven thirteen and three seven no two twenty one <laughs> three seventeen three seventeen. I'm making up my own number. And twenty one twenty one three seventeen twenty one. Twenty one. Uh approx you should have said approximately. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next, that means uh Andy two twenty one three seventeen twenty one is Dan's guess. I'm just going to go with a uh, hundred thousand, hundred thousand bucks. Well, Paula, that's a dilemma. Ooh. Got two good guesses there. Two twenty one, three seventeen, hundred thousand for Andy. Uh, and 21 cents. I'm sorry. And 21 cents. I think it'd be funny if it came in at 20 cents, but anyway, the answer is two twenty one, three seventeen, twenty. 20. <laughs> wow. This, okay. This is a dilemma because essentially now, the question is, do I believe that it was more than 100000 less than 221 Or do I believe that it was greater than 221 
or do I believe that it was less than a hundred thousand? Nice so, job by Andy, by the way, of making that field goal pretty far apart. Yeah. Yeah. So basically now I have to pick a bracket. A uh, p- book was published in 1960. So we're talking on average, $1960, $1970, $1980. Um, the average would trend up over time as inflation increases, but also it would trend down as the book sells fewer copies. <laughs> wow. Carry the one. Is this the same thing every week? Yes. <laughs> every, everybody else says a number and Paula gives us, of course, Paula has no idea what To Kill a Mockingbird is. So I read it my freshman year of high school. But you, oh, I'm sorry. You have no idea who Gregory Peck is. <laughs> <clears throat> Well, all right. I guess I'm going to guess 101,000. Oh. And Andy gets Chelsea Brennan. (laughs) (laughs) There it it is. Chelsea's going to write me a note soon. Stop it. It's just going to have two words. Just the subject line. Stop it. Uh, Chelsea, we love you. I'll say for the record, I made that guess because I'm adjusting to $1960. If that book were published today, I would have guessed 400,000. Otherwise, I wouldn't be in trouble. I understand. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, well, you know what we're going to do? We're going to do what any self-respecting show does. We're going to make you wait a second. So we'll be right back. If you're new to the show, you may not know how happy we are that we partner with Away. Away makes affordable, high-quality suitcases that also charge your phone. You know, we talk about financial independence for so many people. That's travel. And if you're going to travel, why not travel the right way? By cutting out the middleman, Away is able to offer the perfect luggage made with high-quality materials at a much lower price. Comes in many different colors and four sizes. The carry-on, which I own. The bigger carry-on, which I own. There's also the medium or the large. I like the way that they name those, don't they? You know exactly what you're getting into. Carry-on bags. Both feature two USB ports and this high-capacity battery that allows you to charge multiple devices on the go, phones, tablets, laptops, whatever, so you never have to worry about a dead phone or fight with an outlet at the airport. I've talked before that I have no idea what premium impact-resistant German polycarbonate is, but plastics created by German engineers, sign me up. It's ultra-durable, but still lightweight, Smooth ride in any directions on my last two bags in a row. My wheels were destroyed fairly quickly with my TJ Maxx luggage. Not so with my away pieces, which have been put through the ringer since I've owned them. They're theft proof, uh, TSA approved combination lock built in to keep your belongings safe. I have so many trips coming up. It's easy to pack, easy to be organized, easy to wheel on the plane. Also easy to identify If you decide to check your luggage, what I love about away is there's a risk free 100 day trial period. If at any point you decide that's not for me, get to return it, get a full refund. No questions asked, but the coolest part away has got a special offer just for our stackers for 20 bucks off a suitcase head to away travel.com forward slash SB 20. And use promo code SB20 when you check out. Plus, you'll get free shipping any place in the lower 48 states. Again, that's awaytravel.com forward slash SB20, promo code SB20. All right, uh, Dan, you're sitting at 221, 317, and 21 cents. Feeling kind of confident about that? I'm living the dream. Andy, you've got that whole $1,000 between 100000 and 101 I think I've got this nailed down. (laughs) (laughs) And and, and Paula, 101, what are you thinking? Uh, As usual, the minute that I render a guess, I immediately second guess myself. So we'll see. And and, and how are you second guessing yourself? You think it's lower or more? I'm wondering if I should have gone higher. I'm wondering if I should have guessed 222. Let's give her another shot, Joe. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, thanks, pal. (laughs) I don't think we're going to do that. Doug, take it from here. What's our answer? Howdy, trivia nerds. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and today we celebrate the birthday of Gregory Peck. We're talking about money from what many say is his greatest role of all, that of Atticus Finch in To Kill a Mockingbird. 
Today's question is this. How much money per year did author Harper Lee bring in from To Kill a Mockingbird? While certainly some years varied from others, on average, Bloomberg stated in an article from 2016 that Lee brought in $3.5 million per year from the book. I'd stay and talk about it more, but based on those numbers, it's about time for old Doug to go and write his bestseller. See ya! Yeah. What'd I tell you? Whoa. <laughs> Dan for the win. D- Dan for the win. 221, 317, and 21 cents. Yes, I'm figuratively spiking the ball. And and I, th- there it is. I'm amazed at how we were all an order of magnitude off. Apparently, more people, Paula, bought that book than even you had thought. Wow. On average, $3.5 million per year. And we're talking starting in 1960? Yes, that's like the that's art- the equivalent of maybe I don't know a lot more. The article some movie rights that went with it too, maybe. Don't know. I don't know. Don't, don't know. Yeah. Just said she brought in three and a half million dollars from the book, and that she. I guess it would have to, Andy. It must include oh, the movie rights because that's a that is a monster number. It also said that once the the follow up book that uh, remember a lawyer, her lawyer or her agent got her to release the manuscript for the first draft. Um, of the new one? Yeah, it just got released a couple of years ago. Yeah, what's yeah. it what's it called? The Watchman? Um something the Watchman. Somebody's yelling at their device right something now. Something about a watchman. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it might just be the watchman or something. Uh I'm binging yeah. it. I I'm, turned I'm, off my Bing because I didn't want to cheat. I am binging so. it right now. Go set a watchman. Yeah. Mm. Go, go set a watchman. Well, once Go Set a Watchman came out, apparently that spiked up, but this was this was uh not including that time. So Nice wow. job, Dan. That means that Len pulls into a tie again with Paula. So it's OG5, Len3, um, and Paula3. Do me a favor. Give Len the address for the check. <laughs> <laughs> hey, let's take out a magnifying glass and help somebody do better with their money. Today's hotline call comes to you courtesy of magnifymoney.com. When you head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash money. You're going to find that those financial products you use every day, like your savings account, your checking account, nowhere near best in class. Over 92% of the products available online are all ranked at magnifymoney.com. Head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash magnifymoney for more. I know we were just looking at uh, just looking at interest rates on savings account going up again. In fact, let's uh, do that while we're here. We're recording slightly early. Stackybenjamins.com forward slash magnifymoney. And interest rate on a savings account right now, it starts off at balance transfers, click over to savings, get personalized offers, and it looks like we're looking right now at 2.53 from NASB, North American Savings Bank. They also get a rating of A, very transparent grade, and then CIT Bank gets a B on their fine print score, but as 245 and then, um, yeah, a lot at 2.45, 2.44, 2.4. So uh, stackybenjamins.com forward slash magnify money. Today, we're going to help magnify Calvin's money. Say hello, Calvin. Hello, Joe and OG. This is Calvin from California. And I just recently graduated college debt-free, which is good news. And I just started dabbling into the world of personal finance. And um, based on what I've listened to your show and uh, my personal research, it seems as if ETF or mutual fund is the only sensible way to invest. And at the moment, I've already purchased several ETF in uh, different market cap categories and as well as emerging market and technology sector to my liking. But I was wondering what are some other ways that I should be looking at to further you know, strengthen and diversify my portfolio? I would really appreciate your response. Thank you so much for the show. It's great. Keep it up, guys. Hey, thanks for the question, Calvin, and congratulations, by the way, on getting through college debt-free. That is awesome. And for starting early, that's also cool. Dan, we're going to start with you. He has exchange-traded funds and mutual funds just out of college. Does he need other investment choices, the investment types? Well, I'm not sure about the investment types. I, I would stay away from the mutual funds, and I'd focus on ETFs. But I would. there's a couple of things I would avoid, including an annuity. But based on his just finishing college, I'm assuming he's relatively young, uh, which means that uh, beyond the scope of the type of investment, I would recommend to him at a certain point to be very aggressive. Uh, ETFs is a good way to go. Individual stock is something that he really should look into. Some good, strong companies that pay a dividend. But beyond that, 
I think he's doing good stuff. I would stay away from mutual funds, but I think he's doing good stuff. Why would you stay away from mutual funds? You got a lot of questions, people wondering that right now. Too much cost in a lot of cases. There are some cheap mutual funds, but for the most part, and there's another thing too, it's called cash drag. Mutual funds have to keep a certain amount of cash on hand to buy and sell or to actually to pay out people that want to get out. ETFs don't have that problem. So pretty much 100% of the cash that an ETF has is invested, whereas a mutual fund has to carry cash. Andy, were you thinking of any other choices for investment types other than ETFs or mutual funds? Dan adds in individual stocks. You know what I was thinking? If he's a young guy and he's debt free out of college, I mean, this might shift the discussion a little bit towards a different type of investing. But how about getting into real estate? I mean, he could do some house hacking as a young guy, you know, make some money off of people living with him. Also, he's uh, probably getting a job potentially and uh, working into that uh, field. So maybe taking advantage of something like a an HSA where you can do some investing in there with a high deductible health plan. So just kind of looking at different avenues to utilize his money. So HSA looking specifically at that type of a tax shelter. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, uh, Paula, what do you think? Does he need to do anything else? Yeah, I totally agree with Andy. I think uh, particularly assuming that he's young and healthy and HSA would be a really good tax shelter because he can get high deductible insurance. He probably, I'm assuming, may not have a very high health care costs at this point in his life. And so a high deductible plan that is HSA compatible would be really good for him. If he goes the real estate house hacking route, definitely I'd encourage him to spend some time learning about it before he goes that route. But yeah, that could also be a good way to to go about it. Other than that, I mean, ETFs are great so, so long as they're low fee ETFs. I would not go into leveraged ETFs or any of those inverse ETFs, any of those fancy deals. And I would avoid mutual funds and stick with passively managed index funds, which technically an index fund is a form of mutual fund, but colloquially people use them as uh, differently. You've seen this too, Dan. I'm sure that uh, ETFs, now that they're the buzzword, there are some high, fairly high fee ETFs out there now, just because the, some of these I don't know. I don't want to say shyster companies, but some companies mm-hmm. trying to make a little, a few, few extra dollars, calling things ETFs and still charging big fees. Yeah. I mean, you got to be aware of the fees you're paying. I mean, you're paying much more than 20 basis points for an ETF. You're paying too much. But then again, it also depends on the return. I mean, if you're going to get a 2%, 1.5% better rate of return, if you're going to get more alpha and you're going to pay a little bit more in fees, well, of course, you have to weigh the uh, the advantage. But again, relative to mutual funds, and I'm talking about traditional mutual funds, you know, with expense ratios and loads and all that crap, ETFs are a much better choice. Thanks for the question, Calvin. I think overall it sounds like <laughs> this is this is my take. My t- my take, Calvin, is don't get into the sexy of having 15 different investment types. There's no reason to do that. And frankly, when you start straying away from these more basic types of investments, it gets really complicated and complication usually comes with what everybody's talking about, much higher fees. So I don't know. I feel like sometimes Andy, people get a little bored and go, man, I've, I've got these boxes checked off. Let's check off a new one. And it ends up being detrimental. Absolutely. I I think the fact that he's even asking this question, let's say he's 25 or 22 and he's starting now, that is, that's, that's the perfect situation for him to be in. So just start and concentrate on uh, the first part of our conversation. Where can we take advantage of these tax advantages, you know, through your 401k or through a traditional IRA or Roth IRA and uh, really start building up that compounding. Yeah, Paula, it doesn't have to be complicated, does it? No, no, it doesn't need to be. In fact, complication oftentimes, it can, as an intellectual exercise, it can be fun, but it can sometimes get in the way of taking action. So, Keep it simple and you're more likely to follow through. I, I love, Dan, what Paul is talking about, because I'm sure as a financial planner, you see that people struggle with the fact I have so many choices. I do nothing. Well, that's why we don't necessarily give people choices. We tell them what to do. And I know that sounds a little crude, but the last thing you want to do is give someone that's not an expert in this stuff choices because it just confuses them more. Give them a path, give them a direction. And if they want to work with you, they'll take it. Thanks for the- but I will tell you, yeah, if I may on. make a comment too, you know, I'm a bit psychic <laughs> right. and I'd like to make a prediction. This kid, Calvin, based on that question, some days he's going to be a very rich young man. I think so too. I, yeah. I, I, I totally agree. What's funny is, is that Dan was playing on behalf of Len. Dan may or may not know that Len had the magic eight ball. Paula, we didn't need the magic eight ball. We got Dan here. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Well, I'm kind of shaped like an eight ball. <laughs> <laughs> 
Thanks for the question, Calvin. If you've got a question for the show, head to stackybenjamins.com. And uh, at the top of the page, you'll see how to interface with the show. Questions for the show. Click that link. And of course, if you ask a magnified money question, we're going to send you a greatest money show on earth circus t-shirt, which is pretty cool. Our guy, uh, Brad Lark does phenomenal designs with flying pork production. So stackybenjamins.com and right there on the top of the page, that's going to do it for today, guys. This was a ton of fun. You know what? We're going to have our guests go last. So let's start off uh, ladies first, Paula, what's happening at that uh, amazing afford anything podcast. On the Afford Anything podcast, we have an interview with Mike and Lauren. Uh, They're a couple based in Florida who reached financial independence at around the age of, I think, 30-ish. I forget exactly how old they were, but they uh, they have a fascinating life. Entrepreneurship, commercial real estate, and uh, they had their babies in Costa Rica. Basically, every fun, interesting, super cool fire hack that's out there, they've pretty much done it. So they've got a fascinating life story. Their babies are in Costa Rica. Where are they? (laughs) They went to Costa Rica to have the baby and then they brought him back to Florida. Gotcha. Ambiguity. Didn't get that. Yeah. Yeah. They they didn't leave their babies in Costa Rica. Because there's some days, Andy, you've got kids. There's some days. Sometimes you want to just ship them to Costa Rica. Yes. Totally. And Andy's a very good parent. I can vouch for him, but there are days, man. <laughs> Andy, thanks for filling in at the last minute. I appreciate it. Absolutely. I'm glad to be here. Well, what's happened at Marriage, Kids, and Money? Because you've always got some fun stuff going on over there. We've got great guests. Uh, very much like Paula, we invite some really inspiring people on the show that are young families that are doing the best that they can to give their family a great life. So we've got a great guest, Jim White, who's coming on from Route to Retire. He's telling us about his early retirement that he's just had. He's got a young family. A lot of the conversation we're having is, you know, can you actually hit these big financial goals when you have kids? And we're trying to dispel a lot of those myths and showing that, yes, you can still be a father, you can still be a mother and still do great with your money. So those are the conversations we're having over at Marriage, Kids, and Money. So come hang out with me. That is awesome. And available wherever you're listening to this show right now. Absolutely. Dan Angeloni, thanks a ton for hanging out with us, man. We got to have you back and soon. Well, thank you so much. This is the greatest thing since canned beer. (laughs) That's right. And not just any canned beer, Schlitz. (laughs) (laughs) One of my favorites. What's happening over there at Innovative Planning Partners right now? Well, right now what we're doing is we're doing a series of roundtables, and our focus now, believe it or not, is on grief. Remember I said earlier that we coach our clients. Well, we're trying to provide things to our clients that they can take and use in practical life. For example, there's a lot of people that deal with grief, grief about lost ones, grief about losing a job, uh, anxiety about changing jobs. There's all sorts of ways that people grieve, and what we're trying to do is we're bringing in counselors uh, to sit and have a roundtable discussion with some of these folks in a sense, to try to get them to help to uh, cope with that kind of grief. We'll do other series going down the road, but uh, frankly, uh, I can't tell you because then I'd have to kill you. So <laughs> We don't want that. Yeah, so going forward, <laughs> we're going to do more of this. But uh, yeah, we, we're excited about this. We're, we're giving to our clients uh, more than just financial um, assistance. It's kind of holistic. That's really cool. And really, yeah. that those are some difficult. Well, you already know because you're doing the roundtable that that's an incredibly difficult time for people. Oh, my. It's incredible. Absolutely incredible what they go through. And, when you, do, and you know, it's funny because you peel back the onions and they start to go. They start to talk. It's it's good stuff. No, that is good. And when you do a roundtable, do you have groups of people in the room together or online together? Is that how that works? No, no. We do it on site. We do it like the last time we did, we did one at a local shake bar. I, like a health club that yeah. type of thing. Yeah. With, you know, couches and people talking and who's got a box of tissue, that kind of thing. And I know it sounds like I'm making light of it, but it actually is very helpful. No, absolutely. Yeah. And those are times when your clients really need you. And that's, that's yeah. a powerful thing. And people can find you by the way, at my innovative plan.com. Correct. Correct. My innovative plan.com or on Facebook at innovative planning partners. Right. And if you're driving down the road, by the way, or, you know, on your commute or walking the dog, whatever it might be, we got you covered. We'll have all Dan's links on our show notes page at stackybenjamins.com. That's going to do it for today, guys. Uh, Doug, take it from here, man. What should we have learned today? So what did we learn today? First, take some advice from Daniel and the gang. 
Sure, you can spend a ton of time trying to learn the actual numbers around retirement contribution rules, but you know, just save it for a Bing search. Here's what you should know. You should know why each rule makes sense. By knowing the ins and outs of some basic retirement plans, you may be able to construct a richer retirement approach. Second, worried about your investments? No need to get all fancy schmancy, as Joe's mom says. Just keep it simple and you'll be able to more thoroughly understand your investments. But the big lesson? I'd love to tell you the big lesson, but Joe's mom's about to start to kill a mockingbird upstairs and it is my job to pop some popcorn. Have a great weekend. See ya. Big thanks to Daniel Angeloni for joining us. You'll find more about Daniel at MyInnovativePlan.com. Thanks also to Brittany Joyner for joining us. Want to follow the development of the Penji app? Head to PengeApp.com. That's P-E-N-G-E app.com. Paula Pant appears courtesy of AffordAnything.com. This show was created by Joe Salcihai, produced by Richie Rutter-Reese, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, visit us on Twitter at at SBenjamin'sCast or on our Facebook page. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I'm wondering if KY Jelly is actually made in Kentucky. SB Podcasts may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remuneration. There's no way you would take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only, and before making any financial moves, consult with a real financial advisor. What do you suppose they call that? A novelty act? I don't know, but it wasn't too bad. Well, that's a novelty. Welcome to the after show. Dan, this is the part of the show we don't talk about. What happens in the after show stays here. You talked about we'd have to kill you. Back at you, brother. <laughs> so there, there, we, gotcha. <laughs> there we go. I saw this piece on Yahoo Lifestyle. You'll never guess the weird skill Mark Cuban is teaching his kids. And it was written by Cameron LeBlanc. But without getting into this, Mark Cuban says that everybody thinks that these Alexa skills are very difficult. Turns out they're really easy. We know somebody, some people in Andy in the FinCon community that do Alexa skills. Have you tried that yet? I haven't, but I've heard that's the thing that everybody's supposed to do, and I just still haven't done it. I, I it's like always <laughs> number five on my list, and I get through one through four every time. But I was happy to hear how easy it is because part of in my brain it's complex. So he says that's a way for his kids to make money, and he teaches them Alexa skills, and hopefully they can own in on that. But it got me thinking: if that's a weird skill, like everybody has some weird thing that they maybe have taught other people. I know my uh, uh, brother can like wiggle his ears on demand, which always freaks me out. Uh, That's a strange thing. And he was trying to teach my son how to do that. I'm like, please don't do that. Um, but, but, but but does anybody let's, let's, let's start Andy with you. What's a, what's a weird skill that you've uh, you've taught somebody or maybe that you've been taught. Okay. Well, I guess we're going for like weird things you can do with your body. So when I was younger, I had this like skill where you can like make a wave out of your belly. Like, I don't know if you've ever seen anybody do that. It's like a, like a rippling wave. So now I'm teaching my uh, four-year-old son how to do it. Cause he's got these really, he's got this really concave chest and really skinny body. So it looks really weird when it goes up and down. So anyway, that's, that's kind of pretty weird. I figured I'd jump into the conversation with that. Yeah. I think that's kind of disgusting. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Andy. Do you watch a lot of Family Guy? Uh, I have in the past. Yeah. Does he do that? 
Is that he one of does. his skills? Oh, yes. there we go. I'm going to find that uh, as a meme and throw it on this <laughs> Facebook group, Joe's Facebook group. <laughs> nice. Just to show everybody exactly what he's talking about. Dan, uh, while you're talking, uh, what's a skill that you've taught somebody? Well, I'm big into oratory skills. And one of the things that I've taught that I've taught, taught my children who are not children anymore, how to teach someone to go to hell in such a way they'll enjoy the trip. And that, okay. Now everybody's leaning forward, driving their car to work. You know, people, how do you do it? Well, what you do is you, you phrase or you position something in such a way that you'll get someone to believe that the idea that you're giving them is their own. Okay. Example. Well, let me give you an example. Joe, you came up with a great idea for this podcast. I know that your guests add a lot to it, but you are the one that drives the whole thing. That's pretty true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I see what you're talking about. So, so, so you've got these ways of giving compliments of telling people good things, bad things, whatever that makes them. Yeah, you're right. You're exactly right, Dan. Yeah. They stay, they stay smiling. That is fantastic. And I learned that from my wife. That's way better than mine. I was going to say, I know how to speak one phrase in Russian <laughs> and not even very good anymore. It's this one phrase from Russian one of Privyat Nina Kudaviroichi. And anybody who speaks Russian has no idea what I just said because I slaughtered it, I'm sure. But it's but loosely translated, I think it's, hello, Nina, where are you going? So now the kick-ass <laughs> thing is that if I ever find Nina, Paula, if I ever find mm -hmm. Nina I, and she's Russian, I can ask her where she's going. But you know what's going to happen next? Oh, you won't be able to understand her answer. She's going to answer me. And I'm going to be, <laughs> and I'm just going to say it again. Ah, привет, Nina. Good afternoon, <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Joe, I'm going to do you a favor. I have a neighbor that's Russian. I'm going to let her listen to this podcast. She better well, anyway. And ask her to translate that for me and I'll send it to you. Yeah, she's going to say all those words were horrible. Those words were <laughs> or or she's going to say, "Huh?" Yeah, that's that is probably that is probably what she'd say. So, that's that's my uh one really bad skill. How to say uh "Hello Nina, where are you going?" Paula, how about you? Weird skills that I've taught people. Well, I've taught people how to hula hoop, but that's not that weird. I have taught people. Well, it's um, weird the way you do it. No, <laughs> 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 yeah. Combine that I, with my belly roll. That'd be pretty cool. Right. Oh, <laughs> that would be cool. <laughs> I can see what's happening at the next FinCon convention. <laughs> yeah. Awkward moment. <laughs> I tried to teach my cats how to get potty trained once, but that didn't go very well. So that's really a skill that I have not taught. And by that, you're not talking about the litter box. You're talking about going in the potty. Yeah, yeah. There's a there's a whole internet thing about it. You can you can bing it, and uh, <laughs> there's a there's all this information online that swears that you can teach a cat how to use a toilet seat. So I've attempted that, and it has gone absolutely nowhere. So that is a skill that I have not taught my cats. Which sucks because that's like a money saver, like on cat litter. Yeah, exactly. So, exactly. Money saver. You don't, you don't have a box of poop just sitting in the middle of your house. Yes. Who in the hell has that kind of time? <laughs> <laughs> I recommend being self-employed. <laughs> and not worrying about money at all. Right. You're not going to get a cat. 